Hello, and welcome to the Comic Cave. I'm Ramsey, aka Captain Away, and today I'm looking at the collection Joker Death of the Family. Scott Snyder began his career as a writer of short horror fiction before moving on to write for comics, including working on Marvel Comics' Iron Man Noir. He would soon come to work exclusively for DC, though, and would become the one and only writer for the entire run on their New 52 Batman title. Given his history, it probably shouldn't be surprising that his run on Batman focused on a lot of darker and more horrifying imagery, and that certainly would be true of the Joker. A year before this story started, as they tell us several times, the Joker had a villain named the Dollmaker cut off his face to leave it as a gruesome message for Batman in the first issue of the New 52 Detective Comics. When he returns in issue 13 of Snyder's Batman, he begins by killing every cop in the precinct where his face is being kept in lockup by snapping their necks. Even though he never exhibited any kind of superhuman abilities before, he then straps his dead face skin back on and sets about repeating his old crimes for Batman, with the promise that he is going to seek out all of the Bat family and personally see to their deaths. Hence the name of this crossover, itself a reference to the landmark 1988 story Death in the Family, where the second Robin, Jason Todd, was murdered by the Joker. To achieve this, Joker claims to know the true identity of all the members of the Bat family, which he keeps in a little black book. This knowledge supposedly comes from a time when he may have hung onto the Bat boat as it made its way back to the Bat cave. Again, this would have taken superhuman abilities, though, so Bats insist to his Bat kids that the Joker is lying and just trying to get them to turn on Papa Bat. They want to believe him, but it gets to be difficult as Joker begins seeking them out in their various titles, spanning across Nightwing, Red Hood and the Outlaws, Teen Titans, Catwoman, Detective Comics, Batgirl, and Batman and Robin. And those are all the titles that are collected here, so let's see what happens in them and take this away. The collection actually opens with a story from Detective Comics about how the realization that Joker has returned to Gotham has sent scores of Joker-inspired gangs out onto the streets to cause chaos and havoc. One group in particular sticks out as being notably capable and organized, a group calling themselves the League of Smiles. They consist of your worst nightmare dentist, a baker straight out of Hansel and Gretel, an actual birthday clown, and a guy who apparently likes to burn things. You know, cause they call him the Torch. Batman quickly discerns that their connection to each other is that they were all former patients of an egotistical psychiatrist named Dr. Byron Meredith. Meredith died in a fire so bad that he could only be identified by his teeth. Now, the group is being led by a guy named Merrymaker. Yeah. I'm so sure that Dr. Meredith and this guy wearing a plague doctor mask and calling himself the Merrymaker are totally not the same guy. Like, totally. Oh, wait, he is. Because duh. Turns out he was just controlling the League of Smiles to distract the police while he went on a killing spree where he tried to take out his ex-wife and her lawyer and anybody else that inconvenienced him. And it takes Batman kind of a weirdly long time to figure this out, especially seeing as this is such a typical Batman story. It's not a great addition to this collection, but again, it's pretty par for the course, and while I don't love it, I certainly don't hate it. What I do hate is the next story, which is about Catwoman, and comes from Anne Nascenti's run on the series. The story here involved the Joker torturing Catwoman in various ways, mainly taunting her with reminders of her friend that died in the first story arc of the New 52 title, and, um, having her play some kind of weird giant game of chess? He also strips her naked more than once, and has her put on a new outfit, leading to this shot of her being covered in little bat symbols all over her body. What? At the end of it, nothing even really happens. Joker and Catwoman just kind of part ways, and that's it. The whole thing is written like a bizarre bad acid trip, jumping around locations and ideas with no clear logical step between them. Like, here, what is happening here? Did she just punch a searchlight? What? What for? You might argue that the absurd elements fit well for a Joker story, and yeah, I guess they kind of do. But I've read the rest of Anna Sinti's run on the series, and it's pretty much all like this, so I'm not giving her a break on this story. We then briefly touch in on Harley Quinn. At this point, she was already a popular enough character to have made the turn from villain to anti-hero, and joined a list of similar characters in the Suicide Squad. 
She still holds a bit of a soft spot for Mr. J, though, and falls into a routine of letting him take control, dressing her up like him when he was the Red Hood for a brief showdown with Batman at the Ace Chemical Plant. The most interesting part comes at the end when Harley, unhappy with how Joker is acting, fights back. Joker still manages to get the better of her, though, and locks her away in a room filled with bones that he claims is all of previous failed attempts at making Harley Quinn's. Probably it's just intended as torture, but I kind of like this weird and wild concept that actually fits well with a later Snyder-written Joker story, Joker Endgame. Next we move to Batgirl, and as I said in my video about the new 52 Batgirl, this is possibly the best of the tie-ins. Gail Simone's writing is sharp and easy to follow, and it really plays up the emotional side of the comic. It features references to another landmark Joker story, The Killing Joke, with Joker sending men dressed in familiar outfits to terrorize both Barbara and her recently returned to her mother, Barbara Gordon I. It's a powerful moment for Batgirl, as The Killing Joke saw Barbara being shot in the spine, an event that would lead to her being in a wheelchair for many years after that, only having just returned to being Batgirl at the start of the New 52. The story still gets pretty surreal when Joker leads Batgirl to a roller rink where he has her mother held hostage, along with several other people as skaters. He then proceeds to ask her to marry him, proposing with the ring off of Mrs. Gordon's own finger. Finger still attached. Gruesome. To save her mother's life, she agrees to marry him, leading to her showing up to a chapel with another kidnapping victim, a priest, with flowers and a veil. We learn from a creepy flashback where Joker tortures a psychiatrist simply by talking to her that Joker plans for a rather different wedding night, primarily involving a chainsaw and a basement. If I cut off your arms and cut off your legs, would you still love me anyway? Things get even more emotional with the appearance of yet another psychopath, this one Barbara's own brother, James Gordon Jr., who interrupts the solemn event with a hand grenade. No, really. He also manages to chloroform Barbara while she's distracted with almost losing control on the Joker, and this leads us into what will be the first of several first-person shots as the Joker presents the character with a platter of something. We don't see what it is yet, but it obviously can't be good, and he will do the same to all the remaining Bat Family members at the end of their stories. Which leads us to Jason Todd and Tim Drake, also known as Red Hood and Red Robin, respectively. They were the second and third characters to take on the title of Robin, following the original Robin, Dick Grayson, having become Nightwing. As I mentioned earlier, Jason Todd was killed by the Joker, one of the events of the pre-New 52 era that is still supposed to have occurred. Though Red Hood's New 52 title does introduce the concept that Jason was actually picked by the Joker to become Robin. It was actually the Joker's goal to create a Robin that he might use to manipulate Batman, so Jason might be, alone, the one Bat family member that Joker truly knows the identity of. None of that is mentioned here, though, and instead his story starts out with Joker murdering a woman whose only crime was having met Jason in an airport and going on a date with him. She actually suffers a lot even just leading up to this moment because of that because the creators of the Red Hood and the Outlaws comic seem to really hate women. Joker's primary goal, though, is to kidnap both Jason and Tim so he can psychologically torture them with their own past, just enough to hint that he might really know their secret identities, like he claims. This psychological torture, for all the characters, is probably the most powerful part of the entire story, giving us insights into each character and their motivations, while also showing how effective a villain Joker can be without him even lifting a finger. Joker gets Tim and Todd into a room together, demanding they fight to the death for his entertainment. Since Todd is already typically up for murdering people at the drop of a hat, he readily agrees and begins attacking Tim. But the two, somehow basically reading each other's minds, manage to turn their fight around and bring it straight to the Joker. Unfortunately for them, the Joker Todd guns down turns out to be just another dummy, filled conveniently with knockout gas. So next is Nightwing, who at this point was running Haley's Circus, the circus he grew up in and learned to be a trapeze artist in. He brought the circus to Gotham because he's apparently both stupid and crazy, and lo and behold, Joker kills the circus clown and strings him up with an appropriately ironic sign. Get it? Cause the clown was like a knockoff of the Joker? Like Nightwing is like a knockoff of Batman, I guess? Joker also kidnaps Rhea, a former member of Haley's Circus and Dick's ex-girlfriend, who was arrested and sent to Blackgate Penitentiary after she tried to kill Nightwing. I mean, I get it, Rhea. He is a dick. Joker pumps her full of his special Joker gas, TM, and makes her into a knockoff Nightwing. She attacks Dick again until the poison kills her, just so he can feel some man pain. It's pretty messed up. So how does Joker know who to go after to hurt Dick? 
Well, you could say he really does know Dick's secret identity, but as Joker points out himself, Dick hasn't exactly been hiding it well. Having appeared as Nightwing at every stop the circus has made in the past year, and also wearing a skin-tight outfit in the world's tiniest mask. But I'm sure that guy isn't Dick Grayson. Nah. That just leaves Damien, who is upset about Joker having kidnapped Alfred earlier in the pages of Batman. He finds traces of hairs at the crime scene that lead him to the zoo, which, surprise, surprise, turns out to be a trap laid just for him. The Joker proceeds to get very literal with the youngest Robin, having him hatch himself from an egg and drowning him with maggots that a real baby Robin might feast on. The story comes to a head with a Batman infected with a Joker toxin, attempting to kill his own son. Even readers keeping up with the story in all the comics couldn't be sure if this was really Batman or not, because the last we saw of him in his own series, he was knocked out in an electric chair and taken away by the Joker. But it does turn out not to be the Batman, just a martial arts master that Joker dressed up as the Bat. That leads us to our final issue, the one and only issue collected here actually from Snyder and Capullo's Batman. We find everyone gathered at a table, their platters before them, and learn that Joker designed this trap so that if Batman rises from the table, he sets the entire Bat family on fire. It's finally revealed to us what's inside the platters, when Alfred lifts them all to reveal everyone's faces, sliced up and served on ice. Oh man, that is messed up. Joker then gives a pretty long speech about how the Bat family just makes Batman weaker, and how their games just aren't as fun as they were when it was just the two of them. He argues that they are basically in love with each other, and that Batman needs to kill his whole family in order to be truly as strong and driven as he can be. He then threatens to start the fire himself if Batman doesn't, so Batman stands, igniting the gasoline. What Joker didn't realize is that Batman, well, is Batman. He knows the caves they're in are under a reservoir, and blows the roof of the cave to send water pouring down on the fire, which Joker does not find amusing. Whew, so creepy. Can't you just hear that in the Mark Hamill voice? Batman pulls off Damien's bandages to reveal that the Joker never actually cut off anyone's faces. He just had fake ones made? What? Batman confronts Joker deeper in the cave system and begins talking about that time when Joker was holding onto the bat boat to make it back to the bat cave. He says Joker let go at this spot, not because he couldn't hold on, but because knowing would ruin his fun. This is expanded on a little later when we see Bruce pay a visit to Joker in a flashback, where he all but declares himself as the Batman, and Joker looks, but doesn't see. The comic concludes that what Joker fears the most is reality, and when Batman threatens to reveal Joker's true identity, the Joker essentially takes his own life, leaving behind only the disgusting mask that was once his face. We also see that Joker's little black book is actually completely blank. The comic ends with everyone taking some personal time away from Bruce to recover from the mental scars this whole ordeal took on them and learning Joker's final joke. The Bat computer identifies a slight radioactive element that was in the latest batch of Joker poison, an element that's original name, Honium, had the elemental symbol, HA, which just leaves us with the breakdown. I'm not personally a big fan of the Joker, and this story honestly pushes my tolerance of the character. There's only so much suspension of disbelief a reader can take, and this comic severely pushes the limit. All the stories seem to be occurring at the same time, and yet Joker is in all of them. I guess his ability to seem like he's in a dozen places at once is supposed to make him feel more threatening, but mostly it makes it feel less believable. And the setup all of this had to take. I know they keep saying he's been missing for a year, but that's a year real time. Comic time, it does not at all seem to be. The events of the first 12 issues of Batman leading up to this story all took place over the course of no more than a month or so, and most of that was a single night. Even if you give him the year, stuff like the roller rink in the chapel would have taken massive amounts of preparation that had to happen right then. There's no way he could have pulled them off well in advance without anybody noticing. And the amount of coincidence his plan relied on, like Damien ending up at the zoo. Good thing none of the others, especially Batman, investigated the scene of Alfred's abduction. All those ironic traps would have been completely wasted. Or when he almost lost a chainsaw fight to Batgirl, and only survived thanks to the unexpected intervention of James Gordon Jr. What was his plan here? To really cut off her arms and legs? That doesn't seem like it fits with the rest of his plan. It's all just such a mess. So I'm giving this a recommendation level of... Low. 
Individually, the various creative teams do a pretty good job of creating a truly horrific monster version of the Joker, but put together, it becomes a bit of a big, unsightly mess. Thanks everybody for watching. I'm sorry about the condition of my voice. I went to two concerts this past weekend and kind of sang and screamed my voice out at both of them. It was a hell of a lot of fun. Be sure to stick around next week as I look into the nightmare world of another superhero and all month as I go through various horror themed comics counting down to Halloween. Hope to see you then, right here in the Comic Cave.